Hi, everyone. How are you? It's great that you came for our class. I am excited to talk to you more about pregnancy and hopefully help answer some of your questions. And then at the end, we can open things up for more questions. Okay. So let's get started. Do I press the space? Thank you. Space bar should work. Or click. Right. Oh, okay, this is this is me. So there's just some information about my background and any provider you meet, whether they're an OBGYN, midwife, nurse practitioner, will have training in various aspects of women's health care for female body patients, including pregnancy. So most every everyone should be have a training in STI screening and kind of general health. Hopefully general health is being addressed in pregnancy and not just um, the gestational well-being. And so this is some information about Viva Eve. We, like most providers, offer a range of services. You're all welcome to come here if you're not already. Um, but of course, pregnancy, uh, we're, we're here to discuss that. And, I would love to just hear if, um, about people's experiences and if you have any questions about your, the care you're receiving, um, we're here to talk about that at the end too, okay? So at Viva Eve, we definitely want to hear about people's personal preferences and concerns. And hopefully every care provider is, is providing that same kind of emphasis, right? And of course, you're doing all the work in this pregnancy. So your, your priorities are our priorities and how your body is doing and how you're, you're feeling emotionally and mentally is also really important. So today we can talk about different components of the stages of pregnancy. You know, often pregnancy is divided into trimesters and each trimester has some different facets. Um, so we can talk about some things that are common to the experience of pregnancy. And then in terms of advocacy, uh, really, of course, information is kind of the, the biggest piece that we can, we can address. Um, so that's hopefully what this class is providing. And then I was also thinking, I'll, I'll just ask for um, your contact so I could just share a list of resources that I think is helpful that you can read and consult online and in book form um, throughout your pregnancy that just so that you, you feel like you have information you need that you can um, access at home as well as in your visits. So the first OB visit is always really exciting. Uh, sometimes that might be the first time you hear your baby's heart rate. It, sometimes it might just be like you had a positive pregnancy test and you come in for an evaluation um, and so typically a, a physical exam will be involved, at least taking vital signs, blood pressure, pulse, and also finding out more about your story, your background. What is your health history? Have you had um, any cancer in your family, any history of diabetes in your family? The things that are relevant um, to your personal health and things that we want to screen for that might influence what we recommend down the road. Blood tests are a big part of pregnancy. There's a lot of needle sticks, um, especially up front, but less as time goes on typically. But they are important because they provide really good information. We want to know what people's blood type is that can influence um, if someone has a O negative or any kind of negative RH blood, then we would uh, kind of talk through that and, and potentially um, prevent complications associated with that down the road. So Rogam is typically recommended as an example. Um, and then also screening for infections. If there isn't immunity to certain diseases, it um, could affect the pregnancy if someone's exposed. So it's just good to have that knowledge up front. Um, we're always addressing um, the possibility of anemia in pregnancy. There's what we call a physiologic anemia of pregnancy that takes place more at the end of the second trimester when the blood volume is really high and it kind of dilute the red blood cells there. So we kind of expect that. We expect the hemoglobin and hematocrit um, related to our iron, related to our body's 
capacity to carry oxygen. That's what hemoglobin on the red blood cells does. But we just want to make sure that the baseline isn't too low so that when that happens, we're not going into a more severe anemic state. So it's good to screen for that at the beginning of the pregnancy. And then the antibody screening is referring to um, potentially with like a, a negative um, RH blood type. Um, that's a, referring to a protein that can be carried in the pregnancy. Um, those are just some of the things we screen for and also um, looking for a, at a carrier screening. So that's seeing if we as individuals carry certain conditions that can be passed on to our offspring. A lot of most traits are recessive, so it does require being able to, a baby to carry a disease in inheriting that from maternal and paternal sides. So typically if there's any positive result on a maternal side, we'd recommend paternal testing to see if that person is a carrier for any of the same conditions. Urine, you're, you'll probably leave a lot of urine samples throughout pregnancy. It is helpful to know how much protein and, and potentially glucose is present in the urine. That can give us information about risk for diabetes or later on in pregnancy, a risk for a condition called preeclampsia. And then um, also just to see like if there's any um, presence of leukocytes, which you know, a type of red blood cell that could the presence of which could indicate infection, um, and also nitrites that are byproducts of bacterial presence. So important to information as well. And then some providers. Uh, do kind of frequent ultrasound examinations. Um, we do them frequently at PFIT Eve. Um, some providers will order one to take place more around 12 weeks as part of the screening of the uh, nuchal translucency that gets information for risk for Down syndrome. And then at 20 weeks is a really fun and informative time for another ultrasound because that's a good time to see baby's anatomy. Babies are, are fetus is well developed so that like all the pieces should be present, but not so large that it's like hard to, to see all the aspects of baby. Um, so those are some points when ultrasounds might be ordered. Um, or it, it, be, but even, it tends to be more frequently because we have sonogram right in house and in the brain. And so some things to consider um, in, for pregnancy in general, continue taking those prenatal vitamins. We do recommend 800 micrograms of folic acid daily. That's for your baby's brain and spinal cord development. And uh, also, yeah, diet. So though we'll talk, we'll have, there's a nice image coming up of um, kind of a well-rounded uh, vegetable and fruit intake, but so healthy diet being also emphasis on a wide variety of proteins. And so that could include eggs, tofu, chicken, red meat, if you are not vegetarian. It could include yogurt, uh, rice and beans to get a complete plant protein. Like this, that's an example, right? We wanna combine rice and beans or beans with corn. If you are vegetarian or vegan, just make sure that you are also getting a wide variety of, of intake of protein from uh, those sources. So more of an emphasis maybe on the, some of those the rice and beans and tofu, et cetera. Um, and then I, I kind of like to think of looking at our plates and getting clues there for our nutritional intake. So if I'm seeing a lot of colors on my plate, I know that I'm probably getting a wide variety of micronutrients. So, you know, like, kale accompanied by carrots and red bell peppers and purple cabbage, like a good setup. Those are good clues, right? And, um, and then accompanied by, by protein as well. Really avoiding sugars. That's something that's a big issue for a lot of people in the United States, right? Where we have high sugar intake. So important to avoid in pregnancy too. So like the obvious things like candies, baked goods, sodas, sweet coffee drinks, uh, also just minimizing like some of the simple carbohydrates that can spike our glucose um, and then insulin and just could increase our risk for gestational diabetes. Um, so things like white flour, white rice, corn, potatoes, um, not necessarily having to cut them out completely, but um, just kind of minimizing them and having them as part of a balanced diet. 
and lots of water intake, but like at least two liters a day to the point where when you urinate, it's like a straw color. That is a good indication that you're well hydrated. But after taking those prenatal vitamins, your urine is probably gonna be very yellow and that's okay. And then avoiding um, alcohol, cigarettes, uh, any, any medication that you haven't addressed with a healthcare provider um, is, is really important because some prescription medications that are appropriate outside of pregnancy aren't inside of pregnancy. Um, so say like in, in terms of addressing mood and mental health, certain medications, um, the regimen might need to be changed or certain um, medications to treat diabetes, the medication might need to be addressed as well um, once pregnancy is confirmed. We, that's a, an important piece to address a, like kind of on an individual basis. A general rule of thumb is that if someone is, has a healthy BMI, you know, body mass index, which is an imperfect assessment of weight, but just kind of a, um, one easily analyzed piece of information that compares you know, our height to our weight. Um, if someone has a BMI before pregnancy that's you know, 18 to 25, then they can plan on gaining around 25 to 35 pounds during pregnancy, more of that being in the second and third trimester. Um, third trimester you know, has a lot more um, on the fetus, more fat and brain development at that point. Exercising, a good rule of thumb there is to only exercise to the point where you can hold a conversation. If you're out of breath, like can't talk to your friend, then take it easy and you know give yourself some time to rest, take some deep breaths. But continuing to exercise is really important and is you know of course good for our heart health. Also, will facilitate later down the road if um, in, in terms of like a, a vaginal delivery, if that's in the plan, then that can really be helpful for releasing round ligaments, um, just making sure the pelvis is, is ready for that experience as well. And then we have scuba diving is used as an example here. Um, so again, that's like potentially risky in a low oxygen setting. Other things to avoid would be high impact activities. So contact sports like soccer, um, football. <laughs> um, I, you know, I had a patient the other day who is a boxer, um, but she informed me that she's not getting hit. She's only hitting a punching bag. So in, through this conversation we established, that's probably okay, but um, don't get in the ring with someone else and, and potentially have the risk of, of being hit in any way. Um, you know, maybe horseback riding or climbing um, could potentially be dangerous just because of the risk of falls, right? Anything that where there's a risk of impact to the abdomen, we want to avoid. Okay, so this is a great photo representing a bunch of different colors that can correlate with good nutritional intake. This person's going to make an awesome dish. Um, all they have to do is just throw some protein in there and they're good. Um, so this has the information. We have a nutritionist, a di dietitian on staff, Tamsin. Um, she's awesome. She would love to speak with any of you um, and can just kind of help personalize strategies for optimizing nutritional intake inside and outside of pregnancy. Okay, so kind of going to the second trimester, uh, there's a lot going on. The babies um, more towards the beginning of the second trimester, their eyes are developing. Um, and then a little bit later, hearing uh, around the same time, hearing develops. And um, then towards the end of the second trimester is kind of when they're, they're, there's more like yeah, brain and, and fat um, building up in the body. In the second trimester, the, um, oh yeah, so this is just the sonogram from between 18 to 20 weeks. That's a, a really fun one. You just, you get to see so much on that sonogram. Um, the, in terms of, sex of the baby. Um, I should have, I didn't mention the specific um, non-invasive prenatal test that's available 
towards the end of the first trimester. So that is a test that takes maternal blood and it looks at fetal blood circulating in the maternal blood and will analyze for genetic abnormalities. Um, it's a very um, accurate test, so very sensitive for Down syndrome and, and trisomies 13 and 18, and it can also um, tell the fetal sex. And then this can be confirmed at this 20 week ultrasound because often um, genitalia can be seen at that time. The, there's often also, as you can see here listed, um, multiple marker tests that's like, because of the prevalence of NIPT, there isn't as much of that, that test happening, but you might have your blood drawn um, to compare, to see, uh, get clues about baby's um, belly and brain and spinal cord development, as well as more information about risk for trisomies. Amniocentesis um, is kind of less often recommended now. And in the past, it was recommended more, but especially with this genetic testing available, um, not not as necessary because we have these good te blood tests, but amniocentesis can be really useful. It definitely has its place um, if there has been any kind of um, flag in the screening that would warrant wanting to actually um, get, get a guaranteed source of fetal DNA. And that means um, through inserting a needle through the maternal abdomen um, to get a sample. But again, we're not necessarily routinely ordered. And then the glucose screening takes place in, across the board at the end of um, the second trimester, if not earlier, sometimes if there's certain risk factors present, like a significant family history, or in the past, if um, someone has given birth to a baby over nine pounds, for example, or had gestational diabetes in the past, we would do an earlier screening, typically around 16 weeks. But um, everyone, it's recommended that the glucose screen test takes place at the end of the pregnancy around 28 weeks. And that's important just because then we know if there is gestational diabetes, we can address it either depending on the situation with diet changes and exercise, you know, consulting someone like Tammy or another dietitian, um, or in consultation with um, like say it for us, we work with Mount Sinai West and they have a diabetes clinic um, in consultation with their providers. If they think medication would be appropriate, then we can recommend that. Um, it, there's just risks um, with gestational diabetes that a baby could um, be larger in size at birth and also have more issues in metabolizing glucose um, and and also, um, and so we just want to be able to address that and prevent, a, like, you know, ongoing imbalance to, to affect baby. Um, and then there is a high risk for a, a mother to develop diabetes outside of pregnancy as well. So just important to diagnose and treat. And then discomforts. And, and sometimes I think with the discomforts, it's, it's like a balance of recognizing how hard pregnancy can feel sometimes with also like providing reassurance that it's normal. So like not wanting to minimize and be like, you're pregnant, it's fine. But also like, it's okay to, it often is okay. But of course with any discomfort, like our body has pain receptors to kind of signal like something is wrong. So, you know, of course be in communication with us, be in communication with your provider about what you're feeling. And then we can kind of parse out like, okay, is this to the level where I'm concerned and we need to intervene in some way or, or more tests? Um, or can we just kind of like come up with some comfort measures to help you feel better? So aches and pains, um, you know, if you're having severe pain, please, please let us know um, in, you know, in terms of like pelvic cramping, of course, you know, in the back of our mind, we always have to think about the, could preterm labor be, be going on. But um, there's a lot of aches and pains that are not part of preterm labor, and there's just so much adjusting going on in the body. So um, the pelvis, of course, is expanding. There's a lot of stress on the back um, because of this this weight that is in the front, and like often there's a lower doses of pregnancy, so the spine takes on a particular curve. Um, so like a lot of changes there. Sometimes um, a a belt, maternity belt can be helpful because it can just help take some of the weight off of the, the bony structures and the ligaments. 
and just take that on that that weight on. Um, prenatal yoga can be really helpful and just kind of being able to release some of the muscles that are being aggravated, massage, uh, all those things can help. Sometimes a, a heating pad, or hot water bottle, um, but often, you know, walking can help to, um, you know, balance between rest and exercise. But yeah, so kind of bottom line there, stay in communication with your provider. If you're concerned, let them know, um, but also know that your body is doing um, what it needs to do. You know, if, if the, the pelvis expands, the joints um, with hormones of pregnancy are getting looser, um, the idea being, you know, that a baby will, might pass through the pelvis. So um, there, there's a physiologic stretching that happens. Braxton Hicks contractions, they are contractions, uh, you know, of the, the muscles of the uterus that are not contributing to labor. So there's not cervical change with them, but they are the kind of the uterus warming up for labor. You know, it's a, it's a sign that the um, kind of hormones are in place to eventually um, facilitate that, but they typically, you know, will, will come and go. If, if you're having contractions that are getting stronger, closer together, not going away, like, you know, it, so typically I'm always talking to people about hydration because hy dehydration can contribute to the uterus being kind of irritable and just like contracting on and off, um, not necessarily in labor, but can give that a, a kind of make people think that they are. So um, if you're having Braxton Hicks or any kind of contraction, drink a lot of water, rest to see if those contractions go away. Um, and then if, if so, it might've just been Braxton Hicks or related to, to dehydration. Constipation, um, again, like the progesterone that's in pregnancy that is supporting the pregnancy, but it also is making it so that the bowels are moving a lot more slowly and it can be really uncomfortable. So try to focus on, again, hydration uh, that can help with constipation, lots of fiber intake with, with water. So, you know, whole, again, whole fruits and vegetables, and then, you know, just again, being in communication with your provider about like, I'm having a bowel movement only every five days. Like, you get concerned, right? Like that, that's kind of beyond what we want for you. Um, but if you're, you know, you're still able to have pretty regular bowel movements, it's just a little bit less comfortable. Um, you know, we're not necessarily worried, but you know, definitely want to be in conversation with you. Um, discharge, there, it's very common, normal and healthy to have more discharge in pregnancy. So there's just so much circulation through the pelvis. And um, we, you know, so if it's kind of like an increase in the amount of discharge, we're not necessarily concerned. But I would want to know if, if someone's having, you know, like a foul odor, like rotting smell, um, uh, that could be in, indicative of infection or like a, a fishy odor we sometimes notice with bacterial vaginosis, which in pregnancy we do want to treat. And then um, if someone's noticing discharge that's like green, yellow, it also could be indicative of infection. Itching, irritation, let us know. And then, so yeah, with dizziness, like it, that, often that can be very common um there's just again like so much blood flow that is happening throughout the body and, and sometimes when a pregnant person stands up it just like the blood flow hasn't quite caught up to with the heart to provide blood up to the head so um just make sure again hydration being key and then getting up slowly from lying or sitting positions taking deep breaths deep slow breaths um you know if the dizziness resolves right away that's okay. If it's not going away, let us know. You know, we get concerned about, about circulation, about anemia. So again, stay, stay, keep us informed. Heartburn, really common. There, you can imagine like there's so much going on in the abdomen and the pelvis, the poor stomach just like does not have as much room as it used to. So um, some of the contents, and it also with the hormones of pregnancy, like the, our, body the soft tissues are just looser so that esophagus you know connecting the, the throat mouth and the um, stomach the little sphincter there that typically like closes keeps the context of this of the stomach down and um, not in the mouth um relaxes a little bit so just like more can come back up so you, you continue eating but 
frequent and small amounts, like, you know, every few hours, a small amount of food. Um, and then also avoiding lying down um, after eating. And then avoiding, you can kind of see like what foods are triggering this. And often it's spicy food, it's fried food, um, you know, just kind of pay attention to what's aggravating it. And then oh, leg cramps, so it's really hard. Um, you know, making sure that you're getting sources of magnesium and calcium, um, you know, that could be dairy products. Um, if you are vegan, then you can focus on like dark green leafy vegetables, um, like kale and collards, um, you know, trying to do like stretches um, can also help. Um, and then kind of related to the legs, uh, varicose veins can be really common. And um, there's just, again, like the, the circulation increased through the body um, and that relaxation of the soft tissues includes the veins and the, the valves that typically will keep our blood moving up and back towards the heart. Those get relaxed. So a lot more fluid is hanging out in the legs. So if you can like um, elevate your legs, if you have swelling and then with um, swelling or varicose veins, you can try to prevent that with like compression stockings maybe not like so enjoyable in the summer when it's hot, but like it, in the winter, it's nice. Um, and then yeah, again, just elevating hydration and then trying to move your legs. So that will help the little, like um, the blood vessels have little muscles in them. So, and if you're also like using your skeletal muscles by walking, that will help propel that blood back towards the heart and circulation, not just hang out in your legs. And then, oh yeah, urinary frequency. It's really, um, that's hard because again, I keep mentioning hydration. And so, you know, you're going to hopefully be drinking a lot of water, kind of like the stomach, the poor little bladder doesn't have much room anymore. Um, but it, so if that frequency though is accompanied by burning with urination, we definitely want to know because if there is a urinary tract infection, we want to treat that. Um, and, you know, any, of course, any fever or like um, back pain where the kidneys are lower back um, or on your side, the flank, please let us know as well. And then in the third trimester, um, you know, again, those, the screenings continue, the, the blood tests and urine and vital signs, um, you know, we're paying attention a lot to your baby's growth. So whether that's with an ultrasound or um, some practices that will use a fundal height, and so like a provider might feel the abdomen to determine the baby's size and positioning and then maybe measure with a measuring tape um, to indicate fetal growth. And that's a really great way to assess fetal size over time and the fetal growth over time as well. And um, then we're also um, going to be every state I have practiced in. Um, is every some every trimester is going to be assessing for anemia as well as HIV and syphilis routine just because if those infections are present we want to address that with delivery um, and then like pelvic exams they they can be really useful like especially if someone is having signs and symptoms of labor uh, and I know we're going to have a class focused on labor uh, later on but um, if someone is like experiencing contractions that aren't going away or they're, they're wondering, did my water break, you know, leaking of fluid from the vagina, which um, we'll talk more about later, um, then, you know, a pelvic exam could be appropriate just to see, okay, is the cervix opening or are these like proxenex contractions or um, like we, we talked about before. And then, yeah, it's a good time to check in with your provider about, okay, well, so what, this, these are some of my priorities for labor um, and kind of what I'm envisioning and then checking in to see what the like typical hospital scenario is like, um, or if you're planning on a hospital delivery, um, then talking with your provider about what that looks like and the dynamics there. And then group B streptococcus. So that's a bacteria that is really common for adults to carry in the digestive tract. Um, and maybe it comes and goes, but we do test for it. Um, or usually typically at 36 weeks of pregnancy, because if it is present, then there is a risk of the mother passing it along to the baby. And um, especially with a vaginal delivery. 
and that doesn't affect adults, but if a baby is exposed, there is a chance that there is a systemic infection for the baby. And that's when um, IV antibiotics are recommended in labor so that when baby's born, that group B streptococcus isn't present in the maternal system. And then, yeah, the fourth trimester, really important, unfortunately, like often very under addressed in the United States, and there isn't that much support. Um, but that follow up visit is so important, you know, hopefully like in the immediate postpartum, um, you know, in hospital setting, you're often admitted for up to, you know, if it's a vaginal delivery for up to 24 hours after the birth with a cesarean delivery often you know, up to two to three days after the birth um, and then you know birth center setting typically close follow-up in the following days as well as home birth um, and just important time to check blood pressure see how you're doing emotionally and assess bleeding and pain and then breastfeeding if um if someone's choosing to breastfeed it's a, you know important time to check in about that and how that's going and we, we have a class on this fourth trimester and postpartum period later on as well. Oh, in September, yeah. So um, really appreciate you all tuning in. I think now we can open things up for questions. This is information on how to reach us if, you know, sorry, if you want to and um, the, the phone number and everything. So thank you. Oh, cool. Okay, so the one question we have is how has your training as a midwife shaped your approach to care for pregnant people? I, I appreciate my midwifery training because I don't know if this is necessarily different than other, other approaches to care, um, say like in the, for like an OBGYN provider, but I know that as a midwife, um, the training really emphasized like holistic care in terms of like, are we considering the mental and emotional and physical and, and spiritual well-being of the people involved and anything that is important to this person in front of me, how am I addressing it? Um, you know, I hope we all as providers are doing that. I don't think that that is necessarily like limited to one profession or another. Um, I like, you know, I know at Viva Eve, and I, I think this is becoming like increasingly emphasized across, um, you know, functioning healthcare systems is like collaborative care and like being able to run different ideas by people, different concerns, and as a team coming up with a plan. Um, but yeah, certainly midwifery emphasizes like we, this is a whole human and not just an incubator for a baby. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot to address. Um, that's what comes to mind when, when I hear that question. And then another question, will you ever do in-person sessions? I hope so. I don't know if that's on the docket right now. I mean, you know, it, just because of the pandemic, it, um, isn't maybe the best idea to have, because you know we know that in pregnancy, um, pregnant people are more vulnerable to complications from COVID than non-pregnant people. So I don't know if I'd feel like very responsible if I was bringing a bunch of pregnant people into a room all together. And then like, if it was like a super spreader event, I'd feel terrible. So, I mean, you know, masks are great and they can prevent um, the spread of COVID obviously as we know, but um, I guess, yeah, not not currently offering it, but stay tuned. <laughs> okay, and then, oh, weight loss during, okay, is there an acceptable amount of weight loss during pregnancy? It, that is a great question. Um, so that again is like, needs to be kind of tailored to each person's um, situation. So kind of how I approach it is like, not taking pregnancy as an opportunity for weight loss, like weight gain um, still needs to happen. But if someone is wants to lose weight and, and that's kind of you know been advised that like, okay, if, if I'm an obese person, then maybe like weight gain might look more like 10 pounds um, or five pounds during pregnancy. Um, just because we still, you know, this a little 
human is still being developed, obviously. Um, so not necessarily focusing on weight loss, but like appropriate nutritional intake that is focused on health intake of healthy foods, um, the healthy fats, whole vegetables and, and proteins and whole fruits um, versus a focus on weight gain through glucose sources. Um, so I think that just can be like individually tailored. Um, yeah, so I've kind of heard it thrown around like, you know, don't think of pregnancy as an opportunity to lose weight, um, but like an opportunity to kind of tailor nutritional intake. And then some people do lose weight in the first trimester with nausea and vomiting, which I, I didn't talk about very much. And, um, you know, very common to experience nausea that can be addressed again with like small frequent meals, um, ginger tea. Those are some like kind of first line things. Um, motion sickness bracelets like C bands is one brand. Um, and then there can be like a medication approach starting with kind of over the counter um, medications like vitamin B6. Um, scaling up as necessary, but we definitely want to hear as providers if people can't keep down food and liquids, so it's too much, too much vomiting going on. Um, but again, so like some people might lose weight in the first, first trimester, and then, you know, if we don't get too concerned as long as then there's some um, weight gain in the second and third trimesters. Choline needed for healthy pregnancy. Um, I, that's not what like, um, I, I guess to be honest, I'm just not sure of like a specific um, answer to that. Maybe Tammy would have a better answer. Oh, I'll get back to you because I don't, I don't have um, like a, yeah, a value in mind or particular recommendations for that, but I'll look into it. And then with, do I have a way to reach everyone? Okay, okay, with email, I will email you with more information. Oh, Kegels, that's a really great. Okay, so Kegels, um, that's an exercise where we use pelvic muscles to um, like say that the same muscles that if we're urinating and we want to stop a stream of urine, we use the muscles in the pelvic floor um, to do that in, in a Kegel. So those exercises are great for kind of homing pelvic tone. Um, and can be useful like approaching birth to have strength um, and then also after birth sometimes the soft tissues you know can imagine like giving birth like things are a little bit stretched out um, it can kind of help re retone the pelvic floor after delivery as well um, so yeah I think kegels are great so like you, one regimen that you know I've heard thrown around is like try three times a day for, you know, to clench those muscles and release them 10 times. Um, you know, you can do them anywhere, like while you're waiting in a waiting room, while you're in your appointment, you can do them while you're talking to your family in the car, like um, pretty subtle. But I think also balancing that with releasing the soft tissues, like I referred to earlier, because we want tone, but also um, sometimes having like our ligaments and tendons really tight can inhibit um, in labor and birth um, the descent of the baby or the ability for baby to like rotate through the pelvis. Um, and when I say rotating, like um, moving, not necessarily like bottom head and feet rotating, but um, around like as the head is down, um, important in a, a vaginal labor and birth. So yes, Kegel's awesome. Also just keep up the walking and um, prenatal yoga. Um, maybe using a, a birth ball throughout pregnancy, especially at the end can be really good. You know, you can kind of try to have the knees open sitting on the birth ball. Um, those that can also help them prepare the pelvis for labor and delivery. Are there safe alternatives for pain management during pregnancy? Yeah, and depending on the source of pain, um, in terms of like medication, you know, you've probably heard Tylenol is, is typically safe in pregnancy. Um, but, you know, also like in terms of, of pelvic pain, you know, like again, the movement can be important. Um, a heating pad or like hot water bottle, just make sure to protect your skin. Um, 
but yeah, like headache, Tylenol is good, um, hydration, uh, rest. So yeah, balance between movement and rest in general. Those things are, are important. That's it. And if with, if there's like a specific type of pain uh, that I didn't address, you know, let us know too. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much. It's really great to be here. I wish like this was in person. I wish I could get to know all of you better. Um, but you know, this is just where we are in the, the history of the world right now. So take care and let us know what you need. And I'll be in touch with answering that the question that I didn't adequately answer today. Take care, you all.